the Eurasian steppe. Nomadic tribes have populated the steppe since prehistoric times. The territory expands out over 5,000 kilometers and serves as a migratory passage between Europe and Asia. It stretches out between ice-cold oceans to its north and arid desert to its south, ending at the Altai Mountains. Two thousand five hundred years ago, Scythian pioneers navigated this natural frontier in a bid to conquer Asia. Not much is known about this mysterious group of people who inhabited the steppe. Today, their tombs are the only indication of their ephemeral domination over these mountain slopes. What treasures can be found in their graves? What can we learn about these horseback conquerors? How can they help us understand present-day nomadic populations? What similarities exist in spite of a 2,000-year time difference? An archaeological operation is underway. The researchers are braving the elements in an attempt to discover as much as they can from these tombs before they are permanently lost due to climate change. They are running out of time. Global warming is causing the ice tombs to disappear. They represent the last remaining doorway that connects us to the Altai Mountain Scythian culture. Archaeologists hope that it is not too late to make new discoveries. The road that leads to the excavation site is very long. The site is located in the extreme west of Mongolia, one of the most isolated regions of the world. It takes five days for us to get from Ulaanbaatar, the capital of Mongolia, to the Sirgal Valley, 2,300 meters above sea level. Extreme weather conditions in the region mean that access is only possible in summer. The project will last for six weeks, and the team will be completely cut off from the world. Pierre-Henri Giscard, from the Institute of Deserts and Steppes, is leading this Franco-Mongol expedition, alongside Sagan Turbat, from the Institute of Archaeology in the Mongolian Academy of Sciences. Their goal is to shed new light on the culture and civilization of the Oriental Scythians. Scythian civilization encompassed several groups that expanded over the Eurasian steppe from the 7th to the 3rd century BC. They each had their own culture and characteristics and were independent of each other, yet similar enough to be grouped together as Scythians. Anthropologically speaking, they were Caucasian, but they weren't what we would define as white. They spoke Iranian and many other languages. We do not know how they identified themselves because the source of information of Scythian origin is limited. They didn't read or write and were therefore unable to know how the different groups defined each other. The Scythian groups interacted with their neighboring sedentary civilizations, ancient Greece and the Achaemenid Persian Empire. Different cultures existed within the Scythian groups. Most of our knowledge about the Scythian culture concerns the royal Scythians, who lived north of the Black Sea. In around 400 BC, ancient Greek historian Herodotus gave a detailed description of their existence. However, we don't have much information about the eastern Scythians who lived on the other side of this expansive territory. The Siberian and Mongolian Scythian populations in the Altai region were also referred to as the Pazyrics, as it is the name of the main site that has been excavated. Many items have been found and everything has been extremely well preserved. However, not much is known about the owners of these objects. The archaeologists have selected two tombs to excavate. They contain an abundance of relics, and the team is hoping to discover ritual objects and bodies in an exceptional state of preservation. The stakes are high. They want to lift the veil on this unknown civilization that was established in the Altai region between 500 and 300 BC. The surface is intact. It doesn't look like the tomb has been raided. 
They now need to establish if there's any ice inside the chamber, if it is intact. This depends on the altitude. We're about 2,004 meters above sea level, so that helps, but it also depends on the depth. The soil here is compact and they weren't able to dig any deeper. We're not sure if they'll be able to dig more than three meters into the earth. These piles of stone and rocks are called kurgans. They were put in place to prevent looting. Only people of certain social status were buried. The formation of the kurgans is symbolic. Their circular form represents the sun. The Scythians were sun worshippers. But why have they frozen? In summer, rainwater penetrates the piles of rocks and seeps into the ground. During permafrost conditions, the temperature falls below zero, and this water turns to ice. A burial depth of at least three meters is required for the burial chamber to be frozen. The rock piles act as a heat shield. This fascinating phenomenon is under threat. If a tomb thaws, even for a short period of time, it triggers an irreversible decomposition of the surrounding organic matter. For a long time it was assumed that 2,500 years ago, the Altai region was a frontier. Not in the physical sense, the mountains reach up to 3,000 to 3,500 meters above sea level and can be navigated during the summer period. It was thought that it was a barrier in the ethnical sense with people of European origin on the western side and people of Mongolian origin on the eastern side. However, we are now discovering that certain groups of people crossed this barrier and settled here for over two centuries. The mission is taking place far off the beaten track, and this makes it impossible to use mechanical diggers. Everything is done manually. However, the archaeologists are progressing rapidly because the soil that sits above the permafrost crumbles easily. How deep is it at the deepest point over there? Two meters. Two meters. We probably need to dig for one more meter. Ah, yes. Otherwise, we've got a problem. Yes, absolutely. What's this? What's this? Bone? It's completely straight. It's amazing. This is the first time in Mongolia, in the Pasarik tombs, that we have found a group of slaughtered horses in one grave. According to Herodotus, when Scythian leaders died, their horses were sacrificed. Their bodies were placed above the burial chambers. The Scythians worshipped horses. It was here in this steppe, 4,000 years ago, that horses were domesticated for the first time. The Scythians rode without stirrups or saddles, this control gave them a significant advantage over their enemies. They launched attacks at full gallop and were able to shoot arrows with tremendous efficiency. Their horses were their companions for life. And when they died, they followed them to their final resting place. The number of horses that were sacrificed depended on the social status of the deceased. They sacrificed old or injured horses that were useless to the community. Be careful. Oh. 
This is its mandible. It had beautiful teeth. It was an adult horse. It's somewhat bizarre to think that we are in the process of extracting teeth from a 2,500-year-old horse, while just over there are some Kazakhs with their horses. It's like we're frozen in time and the past is catching up with the present. A nomadic family has settled near the burial area. The Kazakhs mainly populate western Mongolia. They found refuge here in the 19th century after the Tsar armies annexed Kazakhstan. They have followed the same migration paths that the Pazriks took through the Altai Mountains, and they follow a very traditional lifestyle. Are these two cultures that live 2,500 years apart inextricably linked? This is an important issue for researchers, as this connection could enable them to validate their archaeological assumptions. An ethnological study could help elucidate their archaeological research. Is she shocked and upset that the graves are being dug up? Christoph Mullera, an archaeological leather and textile expert from the Cape Bronley Museum, joined the project to study Kazakh technical craft and to make comparisons with the artifacts found in the tombs. He's softening it. This technique dates back over the centuries and is still used today. His father told him how to do it. The skin has been cut into strips and then softened in a mixture of water and then yogurt. Many leather items have been found in the tombs. They've been well preserved, which means that they were treated with care. This explains why they withstood 2,000 years underground. This area is like a cultural academy. It's the only place in the world where authentic Kazakh culture remains. But how long will it last? Is there really a link between the people here and what we found in the tombs? They are in one way or another descendants of the people that lived here. This is great. It's intact. This snaffle bit is in a good condition. It can be restored. The joint is typical of Scythian craft. We can see that it was struck between the eyes. This seems to suggest that the horse was taken alive. It appears to have been killed by a blow to the forehead. I'm sure that it was one of the most solemn moments of the funeral. Oh. 
It's magnificent. These two griffins are made out of wood. They embellish the horse's harness. Wood rots in humid atmosphere, but this has been preserved in a dry environment. This rare wood sculpture has lasted for over 2,500 years. These are the kinds of items that we see in books. If this was to be left in the sun for a few hours, it would be destroyed. We're going to dampen it, wrap it in special packaging, and fly it to Paris. These objects will be restored in France, then returned to the Institute of Archaeology in the Mongolian Academy of Sciences, and then exhibited in the National Museum of Mongolia. Eastern Scythian art is very refined, as shown by these lilies that adorn the horse harness, or these griffins, legendary creatures represented by an eagle's body on a lion's back with horse ears and a serpent's tail. The resonance with Greek and Persian mythology confirms the cultural links with the Scythians that settled here, despite the prejudices against them. Non-nomadic people have long considered nomads to be barbarous, uncivilized, and stuck in the past. This image is based on the notion of deficiency. Nomadic people do not have houses, they do not have fields, they do not have cities. They are often considered to be predators, lurking on the edges of a civilization that has all of these things. In reality, 20th century archaeological research has revealed that this isn't quite the case. It seems that at the beginning of 1000 BC, certain sedentary populations gave up their fixed habitat and farmland in order to engage in extensive agriculture and to make the most of the opportunities offered by the expansive steppe terrain. 